Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 337 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Ayalon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and an author. Our third book has now come out on Amazon. It's called From Letters to Leaders, Leveraging Your Fraternity or Sorority Experience to Land Your Dream Job. So go and pick up that book today. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring college students together. Fun fact, I am absolutely mesmerized every time I hear this instrument called the didgeridoo. Uh, you might not know what that is, but when you hear it, the sound is so distinctive and you'll instantly know what I'm talking about. This instrument has taken our next guest all over the world and I can't wait to hear more about it. Now, there is only one Pitts Quattrone. He is a maverick player, a builder, and a teacher of the ancient native Australian instrument called the didgeridoo. A writer of songs from tragic to comic and everything in between. He's a dynamic frontman. He's able to bring an audience to its feet with his singing, playing, and wild rock funk testifying. Whether manic and hilarious or serious as a heart attack, Pitts Quattrone is truly one of a kind. And you're going to see it on full display today. Pitts is a true pro in front of a crowd, a microphone, or even a camera. He had a radio career that began back in 1990. And on the radio, he has been the creator, host, and producer of of specialty music shows as well as voiceover and character voice talent in commercials and recording projects. He's also managed to combine his love of sports and radio by working as a color commentator and play-by-play -play announcer. He's fluent in hockey, football, lacrosse, and baseball. I even had a chance to make fun of him about the Philadelphia Flyers earlier today. So there you go. Welcome to the show, Pitts. All right, Michael. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you and thanks for the invitation. Of course, it's my pleasure. You are one of a kind and you are welcome here anytime. Our listeners are absolutely going to love you. I just, I mean, you're so irreverent. It's so great. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's you, man. I love it. Now, we got to talk about this because this is going to be really fun. See, you decided early on to attend Bucks County Community College. This is Buck U. We don't talk enough about the benefits of community colleges on the show. So what was your dream back then? And going to Buck U, and how did the community college experience help you in your career? Yeah, well, you know, in high school, I really didn't care much about studying or doing work, and I just got by by whatever I can get by on, and uh, not even thinking about going to college at all. And so after graduation, it's like, okay, reality's here, dude. What are you going to do? You know. <laughs> so for about a year and a half, I worked at a series of dead-end hourly wage jobs. And it's like, you know what, man, I, maybe I should go to try college and try it in the, the community college setting and see what happens. And so I applied and I got in, luckily, and, <laughs> and then uh, I started off from there. It's, I, I was originally a business major and I did that for about a year and it just didn't seem like a right fit. And then I switched over into the arts uh, communications and that's where I found my home. That is fantastic. I'm glad that you had a good experience and it actually helped you kind of along the way to figure out what's ahead and what you want to focus on. And, you know, 30 years ago, your wife decided to buy you this instrument called the didgeridoo. What is the history of this instrument and how did things go early on with this instrument for you? Hmm. How about if I play for you just for like five seconds or so and then I'll answer all that. Let's do it. We're here. It's all right here. We don't have to go far. There it is. There it is. <laughs> the didgeridoo. Well, a lot of experts uh, say that the didgeridoo is the oldest musical instrument. No one really knows how old it is. There's estimates between 1,500 and 40,000 years. It comes from the native people in northern Australia in an area called Arnhem Land. If you look at a map of Australia, go dead center straight up there's a city of darwin just east of darwin is a whole big area called arnhem land that's where the didgeridoo was born 
Wow. Very cool. And so how did things go early on when you started experimenting with this thing? <laughs> I had nothing, nothing <laughs> happening. <laughs> well, Amy got me a did for Christmas in 1993. And it was from a world music uh, mail order catalog. It was kind of before the internet was really happening. And um, so it came all the way from Australia. And it was a nice little dig, maybe about four feet long. But the key thing, it came with an instructional cassette. So that's how long we're talking. It was a cassette, a real cassette. Uh -huh. So um, the guy on there was fantastic. And I, I got going from there, but I really couldn't see what he was doing. So that kind of, I, I had to figure those things out on my own, like cheek muscles and all kinds of other stuff and throat muscles. But it was a great explanation. And I just uh, practiced with that instructional tape. Wow, that is just incredible. And how do you keep breathing while you're playing that instrument for such a long period of time? Yeah, well, there's this thing called circular breathing. And what it does is you're breathing while you play the instrument. So the sound is continuous, uh -huh. but the player <laughs> needs to breathe. So <laughs> what happens is, and it, it, there's, there's a lot of health benefits to this whole air exchange. So you're playing, to get the basic sound on the dig, it's that gives you the drone. It resonates down the tube. It's mm -hmm. a hollowed out tree branch. That's all it is structurally. Uh, so you get your lips going, eventually you're going to run out of air. Right. So be right before you need the air, you have to kind of anticipate it. You catch some air in your cheeks on its way out. And with your cheek muscles, squeeze in. And that keeps your lips flapping just for a second or two. And that's your chance to breathe up your nose. So it's one big circle like this. So just that little amount of air puffing out, you're not actually breathing out, you're just emptying your mouth chamber to keep your lips flapping for that second, and then you breathe up your nose. Wow, I can't believe you figured all this out. This yeah, is, uh, this is great. really, really cool. So how did this passion of playing this instrument now go from just playing it at your house and experimenting? How did you go all over the world with it? Well, I owe a lot to this instrument. You know, it, it came to me at a critical time in my life where there was a dark road and then there was a didgeridoo road and there was a fork. And luckily, I took the road to the didgeridoo that the didge uh, took me to. And that was the healthy path. So uh, I started playing it because I love weird sounds. I was always the kid in the back of the room making weird sounds, class clown, you know, getting people to laugh. And uh, so I, I heard the didgeridoo in, I think it was the Crocodile Dundee movies in the 80s. Yeah. And I was like, man, what is that? That is so cool. Yeah. So I, I did some research, dug in, and I found out what it was, where it's from. And uh, in that movie, it's, it's obvious where it's from. But more and more things about it, like certain playing techniques, how is it used traditionally? So I, I, the, the, initially the sound was the big magnet for me, but then the more I found out, the more and more I felt connected to this instrument. Mm. Yeah, it's such a distinctive sound. I mean, as soon as you hear it, you're like <laughs> Australia, like immediately. Yeah. It's so cool. So how do you take this instrument and this sound and now start to collaborate with different musical artists? Like what is that collaboration process like for you? Yeah, it, it, generally it's fun. <laughs> so I really believe that the dig can be a critical part of any type of music. And so I grew up in the Philadelphia suburbs in the 60s and 70s. I'm not an Aborigine guy from Australia, but I play their instrument and I put it in my music and my roots, what I grew up with. So basically you just have to find out what song, what key the song is in, and then you pick the uh, appropriate dig in that key and boom you can get in there and when it locks in for certain songs man it's so powerful it's like the real nice foundation and then you can do rhythms you can do rhythms of the song already or a counter rhythm to what the drummer in the song is doing and then then you can put your voice on top of everything so it's uh, there's all kinds of really cool cool possibilities with the dig and I've been invited to places. You asked me how I 
travel around the world, people mm-hmm. invite me somewhere. Hey, Pitts, I'm going to Greenland for two weeks to this uh, children's home 250 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Do you want to bring a didge and show the kids there? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> like, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> so I get invited to places. And the same thing happened with uh, I went to Senegal, West Africa. So uh, there's a, a really cool organization called the Senegal America Project. There's one Senegalese guy and one American guy. They started it. They're both drummers, world class percussionist. And uh, the American guy is Tony Vaca, V A C C A. Mm-hmm. And the Senegalese guy is really well known. His name is Masamba Jope. And Masamba is in uh, Baba Mall's band, who is like a god in Africa and in Western Europe. And Masamba is also uh, the lead drummer in all the Black Panther Wakanda Forever soundtracks. Right. So these guys are my buds, and they're like, Pitts, that, get that didge and let's take it to West Africa. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, wow. yes, please. <laughs> so it was really cool. I'm like, I, I, I'm, I live in Vermont now. I've been here for 25 years. But it's so I'm taking this ancient instrument from Australia to Vermont, and then I'm taking it to another ancient culture in Senegal. So wow. I'm playing jamming with these guys. It's fantastic stuff. We did tours and Masamba took me to his granddaughter's school. So I was showing kids how to play. It's it's I owe a lot to this hollowed out tree branch. Wow. Now I see you have a collection of them behind you over there. So is each one, depending on, I guess, the the width or the girth of this thing and the length, does that contribute to a different key for each ditch? Yeah, it's just like any other instrument. The long, deep, the long, uh, wider ones are going to be deeper and bassy uh-huh. and the short ones are going to be high and bright. So, yeah, um, yeah with the ditch. Technically, it only plays one note, but you, a, a skilled player can bend that note almost a full step up and down. So you have uh-huh. some flexibility there and you can do all kinds of rhythms. So that's a really cool thing. So um, it's not just a straight drone like you, know, you would get on like a bagpipe or a concertina. It's There's a lot of really neat dynamics inside. The, it's a complex instrument. Yeah, that's what I was wondering, if a skilled player would be able to bend that at all, just given one ditch. Um, and apparently the answer is yes, if you're skilled at it. So that's really cool. Now, I know on your website, you make some of these handcrafted ditches. How do you how do you make one? Well, um, in a few different ways. Uh, traditionally, first, let's start there. Go back to the old school in Australia mm-hmm. is uh, different types of eucalyptus trees make great didgeridoos and the instrument maker will go around and look for a termite mound near some uh, eucalyptus trees and the termites are key in this process because what they do is they go in the ground they go up the trunk eat their way up the trunk and out the branches to make it in uh, hollow inside Mm -hmm. so the instrument maker what he does or she grabs the branch and knocks on it and listens for how hollow it is and that trained ear will know like okay this one's perfect i'll cut it and bring it back to to the house or i'll let it be and come back in a couple months let the termites do their thing or it's totally uh, shot and it's it's too far gone right so um i don't want to attract any termites in my house (laughs) (laughs) no termites here (laughs) So um, there's a few different ways, depending on what I'm dealing with, uh, what kind of shape the instrument is. Most of the time, I drill it out. I work with a a tree called Polonia, or princess tree is a nickname for it. Mm -hmm. And what I do, it it grows pretty much hollow the first two to three years of its life or a new branch. So I have somewhat of a tunnel for the drill bit to follow that tunnel and mm-hmm. I'll go in one end and I have a long drill bit, it's an electrician's drill bit, 54 inches. I go in one end and then I flip the dig around and then I go in the other end to complete that tunnel. And there's no holes or anything on, on the sides of the dig. It's one long hollowed out tree branch with holes at the each end. And the top end is the mouthpiece end. So I'll shape and form that and sand it and finish it. And then the other end, the bell end, it's the real wide, kind of like a, a trumpet, you know, it, it flares out at the end, mm-hmm. but, but with wood. 
<clears throat> so what I do there is uh, I'll carve it out and hollow it out as much as I can, get as far down in there as I can to complete the process. Wow, that is just absolutely fantastic. So, all right, so today, I don't have to tell you, we are such a divided nation right mm -hmm. now in the United States and really, to some extent, a divided world. Um, so how has this instrument helped to bridge cultural divides, in your opinion? Well, it all starts with music. You know, mm -hmm. music is the great communicator, the great glue that brings us all together. Even if I can't, if I'm in a, a, a musical situation and d different people in that band or speak different languages, I can't talk to them like that. But once we start playing a song, then we're communicating. So that's the key right there. It's like, and everybody smiles. It, I, I don't know even know how, say, know how to say hello in this guy's language, but we're, we're smiling, playing a tune, and then it, it all comes together like that. So the didgeridoo is, like I said, uh, it, from Africa, from Australia to Vermont to West Africa. So just those three things right there, it's bringing three different cultures together. Mm, music is the answer, right? That is the big, uh, you know, something that connects people immediately. I'm sure as soon as they hear that instrument, they're like, whoa, what is that? <laughs> um, very, very cool. And you kind of hinted at it earlier, but talk to us a little bit about the health benefits of mm. playing the didgeridoo. Yeah, there's a lot of health benefits. This uh, study came out in 2005 about this. Uh, the British Medical Journal published this study mm. about a doctor in Switzerland who had uh, 25 sleep apnea patients who were looking for an alternative treatment uh, away from that CPAP mask thing. Mm -hmm. So it's like, all right, what can we do? So somehow the doctor figured out that playing the didgeridoo uses muscles that are usually the problem with sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. So he brought in a didgeridoo teacher <clears throat> and they played for six days a week for four months. And at the end of that four months, the apnea episodes either totally vanished or they were greatly reduced because in sleep apnea the throat muscles and everything under here it's been explained to me from doctors that um, those muscles get flabby and loose and they block the airway uh -huh. so playing the dig especially that circular breathing thing i talked about it's an internal workout for those muscles. Wow. So after three, four months of playing, they're really nice and strong again and straight and taut so that airway is completely unobstructed. Wow, I am totally blown away. I mean, I got this double chin thing going on and I'm thinking I need to buy a didgeridoo from you so I can get rid of it. <laughs> Who knew, well, I'm, you con know? I'm convinced any amount of didge playing is benef the player benefits. And uh, I teach people all over the world. I teach online, in person, group settings, one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, more than half of my students are sleep apnea sufferers looking for an alternative. So... <clears throat> we, we start out by just flapping your lips, getting that nice, basic elementary drone, because that's your foundation. You can't build on top until you have that foundation. So once you have that, then there's a bunch of other exercises and sounds that we build, build, build. And at the top of that mountain is the circular breathing air exchange. So on their, when a, a person starts playing on their way, they'll notice that they can play for longer in one breath. And I told, tell all my students, like, when you start playing, time yourself, and it doesn't matter how long it is, but just play and do that for as long as you can and write it down, 10 seconds, 12, whatever. Okay, <clears throat> and then practice every day for 15, 20 minutes. Do that same gauging exercise one week later, that breath is definitely going to be longer. It's longer every time. Wow. That is just so fascinating. So how do you teach people? Is it through like videos? Do you do like live Zoom sessions? Do you go in person? Like, how do you do this with other students? 
Yeah, pretty much all of that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> These days, in the last few years, it's usually one-on-one -on, -one on Zoom or, or FaceTime or you know, Facebook Messenger video chat, some type of video chat. Uh, but I also go to schools. I go to museums, retreat centers, uh, festivals, wherever, whoever will have me in uh and I'll do whatever, you know, I'm very flexible, whether they want me to do an educational thing or straight up performance or my band. I have a five piece band. It's like this rock and funky, really cool thing. Mm -hmm. Or uh, maybe it's just one on one with kids, whatever it is. And I'm real flexible working with uh, the organizations about like what their vision is. OK, cool. So how can we work that out to make that happen? Man, see, I think this is like the perfect instrument for college campuses because, I mean, yeah. you start playing that thing and everybody is going to come out of whatever cubby hole they're in <laughs> and be like, what is that sound? Like, I, I have to know. Like, it just, it brings people together and they just have to know what's going on. Am I right? You're totally right. It's the college crowd, aged people love the didgeridoo. There's an example. A couple of years ago, I had someone contacted me. He was a student down at UMass Amherst. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, all right, I'm going to go down there anyway because I have some friends there and I'll make a day out of it. So I met this guy on campus in like a, a little cul-de-sac and he was trying out two or three different digits that he was going to buy. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he and I started playing, people started coming out of the dorms. Boom, boom, <laughs> boom. It's like a freaking magnet. It's, <laughs> it's a like magnet. The Pied Piper is here. It's yeah. the Pied Digger. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is great. I, you know, I know, you know, fraternities and sorority members that are listening to this, they're always come, trying to come up with something new and creative to bring people out, to get people to come together and to, you know, explain what their organization is about and get new people mm. to join them and uh, i'm going to get you connected with my buddies over at the university of vermont i mean they gotta you know hear you play this thing and then see what happens i mean i just think it would be great you really are the pied piper in a sense you know? <laughs> and if you can get people to come out and just say what is that teach me that and then yeah. we could have oh by the way hey sign up for this organization i mean it would be great i just i see it's just wonderful things here together <laughs> yeah thank you Michael, you're, you're spot on. I mean, it, it's really cool. It, it, everyone loves the dig. It's crazy. Yeah. And there's everything about it is positive. There's nothing negative or weird or it, it's it's all positive and healthy stuff. Yeah. So if we can bring the dig out to the world and college campuses are perfect. You know, I've performed at UVM several times. Yeah. And uh, sometimes I do just like a straight performance thing, just dig and no right. electronics. Sometimes it's I have a beatbox where I got all kinds of beats in there and different members of my band recorded stuff in. So they're stored there so mm -hmm. I can do a gig and sound like a full five piece band because mm -hmm. I have all their tracks in there. Or sometimes it's just a one-on-one -on -one, uh, lesson, but uh, yeah, it's it's a great atmosphere for the for the instrument. Oh man, oh man, I just love everything about it. And it's something we can all agree on. I mean, you could be a Republican, you could be a Democrat, nobody cares. Like the music and the ditch just cuts right through all of that. It all yeah. evaporates with the ditch. And that's why I love it. I think it's really, really so great and such a cool instrument. And so thank you so much for sharing that with us. I think that's uh, fantastic. Now, you know, I do love good food here. You know, you're talking about Vermont, you're talking about Africa, you're talking about, you know, Australia. These are all places that have some delicious food. And occasionally I do get up to your neck of the woods. I was just speaking at UVM in Burlington and I noticed right. that there are some great food spots in town. I mean, some really, really good food. Is there any uh, restaurants that you recommend in the Vermont area? Yeah, well, you know, Vermont is is really unique in a lot of ways. And one of the ways is the, the uh, farm to table. Right. And, and uh, or you go down the road and mom and pop has like a little shack set up and you can buy fresh pork or lamb or or veggies, whatever it is. And, and you put your money inside the box. It stays there and you pick out your package and you go. Yeah. So it's still really cool like that. And um, the, so that translates into different restaurants. So um, I'm about an hour from Burlington. My, my real hometown, what I consider my hometown is the state capital of Montpelier. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And Mar Montpelier is a really unique little town. There's a couple things that uh, it has. It, first of all, it's the smallest state capital of all of them. There's, there's only 10,000 people in the entire town. Wow. So that's one thing. And another really cool thing food-wise is within the city limits of Montpelier, there is not a McDonald's. Wow. <laughs> Shocker. Yeah, he's like, yes, <laughs> celebrating. No McDonald's allowed. <laughs> yeah. So that it, there's one down the road a couple miles, but it's not in town. Yeah. So that's a really cool thing. Okay. So getting back to Montpelier. Yeah. Um, the New England Culinary Institute used to be in Montpelier for about 30, 35 years. They recently shut down. Uh, but some of their alumni and even uh, teachers have stayed in the town because they want to live here. Sure. So as a result of that, there's a lot of really cool little family spots in town. And anywhere from there's a place called Sarducci's, which has been doing their thing for 35 years fantastic italian food they got the the big fireplace going and the pizza guy you know all that stuff and all fresh ingredients from local producers yeah. so there's sarducci's and i wrote some down because i saw your notes and in the and keep in mind this is a town of ten thousand people in the state right. capital right there's a lot of really cool little food options for us there's two pho places there's one it's called uh the uh pho capital or pho capital mm -hmm. that's an eat-in restaurant family run and then there's another family run called the uh pho pho express nice. <laughs> mostly take out yeah. all kinds of great stuff there uh -huh. and then there's one of my favorites is called k sherpa and it's uh it's opened in the last year or so it's a combination Indian uh, Nepali food wow. and the folks are the folks are from India. I mean, this yeah. is like the real deal food, like somebody's grandmom's kitchen. This is great stuff. And it's wow. right in Montpelier downtown. So um, there's another one, uh, uh, kind of a, a fun place called the uh, Hippie Chick Pea. <laughs> <laughs> so they specialize in uh, Mediterranean stuff like falafel and gyro. And all these places are individually family owned, independently owned. There's no big chains, at least right downtown. Yeah. <clears throat> and they Man, try to I get, love that. And they try to get source their material, their ingredients as much as possible from locally or at least in state. Um, so there's one place that is at the top of my list that is the, the creme de la creme. It's a small, tiny little place with four tables. It's called Willy Wands. Okay, this, there's a woman who lives, uh, she grew up in Thailand and she is the chef and it's fantastic. There's four tables and then there's a big takeout window. They do, a, a, their takeout business is pretty much <clears throat> the bulk of their business. Right. They're, only op they're only open for lunch between 11 and two and there's only three things on the menu and that those three things change each week so it's uh monday through saturday from 11 to 2 and then so another cool thing is there's a lot of different uh parks and places to sit down and relax in downtown montpelier mm -hmm. so if you get a takeout order from willy wands they give you an actual bowl or a plate like a porcelain plate wow. so you do you go sit down somewhere you enjoy your food you bring it back it's that <laughs> i've never seen that before nowhere else in the country can you do that <laughs> right you name the place that does that <laughs> oh man it, it's so unique and some of the, the food is incredible yeah. and i put i got the this week's menu is something that one of the dishes is called kana nua which is a uh, sliced beef veggies chilies, garlic, and a, a black soy sauce. And oh all, the, all the dishes are 11 bucks and you get a nice giant plate of food like from somebody's grandmother's kitchen in Thailand in downtown Montpelier. <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable. See, I'm so happy I asked you the question because you had the answer. I mean, I'm getting on the next flight, you know, to Vermont <laughs> so I can go and try this out for 11 bucks. I mean, this is great. <laughs> yeah, and, wow. and that's only like a sample of the, the restaurants in Montpelier. It's a small little town, but there's so many options. It's fantastic. Yeah, the culinary options are just incredible. I mean, wow, who would have thought, right, in a town of 10,000 people that you had that much diversity in terms of food? 
Yeah. I mean, that's fantastic. And it's beautiful, too, on top of all of that. Vermont is one of the prettiest places you'll ever see. I mean, you know, I went out there uh, to speak recently and I was just in awe just looking around. I mean, it's just it's a feast for the eyes. You have to just go and see it for yourself if you haven't been to Vermont recently. Um, the winters can get a little, you know, too cold for me. But yep. <laughs> as it warms up and now we're kind of in that space, it's beautiful. It's stunning. Yeah. And really, really great. Well, right now it's uh, sugar season. Sugar season and mud season are pretty much at the same time when yeah. it starts to warm up and the roads get muddy and then it freezes, refreezes at night. So, and that triggers the maple syrup, the, the sap to, to run. So that's all collected and there's sugar houses all over this place. Love it. Absolutely love it. All right. So if our listeners, if they fell in love with this instrument, and I know that they did, and they want to bring you and the didgeridoo to their college campus, maybe as an event performer, where should they go to connect with you? Well, everything's off of my website, and it's just my name.com, and that's Pitts Quattrone, and the spelling is P-I-T-Z-Q-U-A-T-T-R-O-N-E.com. Or if you just want to search Vermont Didgeridoo, I'm going to be the, the first 75 things to pop up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There's another way to find it. So really, really cool. PittsQuatrone.com. Pitts, what can I tell you? You are one of a kind. I really thank you for introducing us to this instrument so that way we got a chance to hear it and hear all about your adventures all over the world. I think mm. this is a great fit for college students. If you want to get you know, people out and, uh, and really asking questions and coming to hang out, um, and, and just coming together around something that we can all agree on, I think the didgeridoo is for you. So thank you, Pitts, for sharing that with us today. You're welcome. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me on the show. Of course, it's our pleasure. And to our listeners, if you enjoyed this conversation with Pitts today, make sure that you like it, share it on social media, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.